Welcome to Paradise in the Pines, a podcast about the people, places, and stories that make this the home of American golf. Brought to you by the Pinehurst Southern Pines Aberdeen Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. And welcome to Paradise in the Pines. I'm Phil Wurz, the President and CEO of the Pinehurst Southern Pines Aberdeen Area Convention and Visitors Bureau. We are joined today by John McGinnis. John, welcome to Paradise in the Pines. Thanks for having me. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, you may not know his face, but you probably know his voice. John <laughs> is the uh, talent for the McGinnis and Katrick On Tap show on Sirius XM PJ Tour Radio. He actually hosts the show uh, from 4 to 6 uh, during the week. Uh, we're here at Pine Needles Lodge and Golf Club in Southern Pines. Uh, we were just a week away from the U.S. Women's Open, uh, as this records, uh, for a late May broadcast. Uh, it's great to be here on site uh, and welcome to Pine Needles. But you've got a history here. I, I do. I, I, I was fortunate enough in college, which I hate to tell you how many years ago that was, uh, to be a camp counselor here. And And when you think of it, a 20-year-old me probably shouldn't been, have been in charge of anybody, <laughs> but I stayed in the Bogey Lodge, which is the farthest one from where we're sitting up the hill, and I had a, a group of kids, of eight kids, that I was responsible for getting to and from all the activities. But during the day, at the back of the driving range, which is over your left shoulder, I was on that driving range with Peggy Kirk Bell wow. for two weeks watching her teach these kids. Yeah. And, and the simplicity with which she gave instruction... Uh, maybe the greatest learning experience of my life when mm. it came to ga- it came to golf, and I went on to have a professional career, now a broadcasting career. And anytime I think back to when I was inspired to to try to chase the PGA Tour dream and all of those right. things. It's not, it, it comes right back here wow. to, to Peggy Kirk Bell. That's awesome. Well, you mentioned Peggy Kirk Bell, and during the U.S. Women's Open this year, uh, NBC will do a tribute to her, from what I understand. And, and y- I met her one time, very briefly. Uh, you got to spend some time with her. Just give people a sense of, of what she was like, because she is so revered and so respected. She had such a great presence. Uh, even, you know, these these 12-year-old kids who are very difficult to keep entertained and right. engaged, uh, listened to her. You know, that when, when she spoke, you, you paid attention, uh, regardless of the age. And what was fabulous was, you know, in between sessions, she'd tell stories about playing golf mm. with her good friend, Babe Zaharias, and wow. I mean, just these incredible stories of her life in the game, and I, I feel I feel very fortunate to have been just old enough and just smart enough to appreciate it. Uh, I, I, I didn't miss, which was great. Yeah. So you went on to play collegiately at East Carolina University. Uh, did you play with Macon Moy? I know Macon. I, I, I'm friends with Simon Moy. I played with Simon Moy, his okay. little brother. I okay. played a lot. I, I did a lot of gambling with Macon after college. <laughs> <All right. laughs> I think he still does. Uh, he, he was a heck of a player. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I played with all those boys. Uh, you grew up in Durham, went to East Carolina University, had a chance to play at bigger schools, but you got a chance to play at East Carolina. Talk about how you found ECU and how it developed there. The the coach at East Carolina uh, actually went from Methodist College in Fayetteville to ECU uh, pretty late in the summer, and I'd been accepted to ECU, and I hadn't really made a decision. Uh, I was almost going to go to Old Dominion and, hmm. and play golf there, and uh, and Coach Morrison said, yeah, you know, come down here. I don't know what it's going to look like. I ended up uh, qualifying for the team and uh, played every event but one uh, for the next well, four of the next five years. Uh, there, there was a, there was a little gap yeah, here in there. Five year plan. East Carolina could do that to you, folks. Yeah, right. Still the same down yeah. there. Uh, but it was it was great because you know I was good enough immediately to start. If I'd gone to to a bigger golf school, and I'll tell kids this today: go to where you can play. Yeah. Sitting at home while the team gets on the bus or the plane and goes to an event doesn't make you better. Going to that event and playing against kids that are better than you makes you better. I mean, I played against uh, Lenny Matisse and David Duvall and, and yeah. you know, Stuart Sink and, uh, you know, a whole list of, of future tour players, some even future Hall of Famers, yeah. right out of the gate, which was great. You talk about kids, and this area is renowned for the U.S. Kids World and Teen Championships, 2,500 kids. Uh, from around the world and around the country come here every last week of July, first week of August. Uh, U.S. Kids Academy is at Longleaf Golf and Family Club. Dan Van Horn, the president of U.S. Kids, uh, has his foundation here now. Talk about when you were a kid versus, like, what it is for kids today. Well, I mean, obviously today there's uh, the AJGA is is the end-all, be-all yeah. for 
advancing to uh, to collegiate golf, but they were really in their infancy back in the 80s when, mm-hmm. when, I, when I was a kid. But we would come down here because Carolina's Golf Association had, you know, the Donald Ross Jr., the North South Jr., uh, just a, a list of – that was the Whispering Pines Christmas Classic in June uh, because it kept getting frozen out at Christmas. Uh, so we would literally spend half the summer down here or more than that, uh, you know, playing in junior tournaments. And, uh, you know, you got to know the coaches in the area. Yeah. Uh, and it was it was great. The um, you know, you're talking about playing at East Carolina. Um, you went on to play on the PJ Tour for for a decade and a half, and uh, without going to, through all your uh, glorious stats on, on the PJ Tour, uh, would it be I think s- you could have done it already. <laughs> would it be safe to say they say people are players are a grinder? Would you say that you were a grinder? Because I mean, you, you worked hard for that decade and a half. There was a, there was a, a period of time in the early 2000s where. I'd been at it for for over ten years, and I was either going to get and I'd been I went to, I went to Q school twelve times, yeah. I went to the finals nine times, I got my card that That's way crazy. three times, I got my card a couple of times through what's now the Corn Ferry Tour. Yeah, uh, I only kept my card on tour twice in top one twenty five. So uh, I, I was either going to get a little bit better, or I was going to get a little bit worse, <laughs> and either one of them was going to make we're going to make my life make sense. Yeah, and unfortunately. I started to get a little bit worse, and then I got a lot hurt and uh, blew out my elbow, and, and that was pretty much the end of it. But it's not exactly a sad story, folks. It's all worked out okay. What uh, what, what made you, through all those Q school, what, what kept you going? Just, just the hope I, that I studied you'd find English, the fire? I studied English and philosophy at East Carolina. <laughs> None of the big philosophy firms were hiring back right. then. And, <laughs> and I, I didn't want to teach – English or golf, and yeah. so I didn't really. I, I never looked like I looked at it like I had a fallback position. Right. I mean, I always knew I could sell something if I had to sell something, um, if it, it push came to shove. But you know, I, I, I really thought that, and I think you have to have this mentality that my best stuff was going to win a golf tournament at some point in time. And I lost in a playoff on the PGA Tour, and I, uh, you know, when I, on the years that I got sent back down to the Corn Ferry Tour, I'd always win out there. Yeah. But uh, as Scott Hope told me, well, if you can't win out there, you can't win out here. Turns out I could win out there, but I couldn't win on the PGA Tour. How thin is that line between uh, razor thin? Yeah. Uh, I mean, look at the guys today. Look, look at Tony Finau, who uh, finished second in, in Mexico. What, what's that, his 16th or 17th runner-up finish mm-hmm. with, with just a couple of victories on the PGA Tour? I mean, this guy could literally have 15 or 16 wins and, and a couple of majors if things had just gone yeah. slightly differently. While well, there's other guys – who every time they get a chance to win a golf tournament, they win the golf tournament. You, you never, you never hear of Justin Thomas almost winning. Mm-hmm. You know, you, you never hear of Jordan Spieth almost winning. With those kids, for whatever reason, and I can't tell you what the difference between what they've accomplished and what Tony Finau hasn't accomplished. I can't tell you what that difference is. Yeah. I don't know that they can tell you what that difference is. But there is a difference, and it's, it's recognizable. I mean, you look at arguably the greatest golfer of all time, Jack Nicholas, 18 right. majors. How many times did he finish second? Like 20, uh, 19. Times? Yeah. Not, uh, a lot. Uh, it's, uh, it's a record that nobody wants to break. Right. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so we, we talked about East Carolina is currently a, a really good player on tour. Uh, Harold Varner. Uh-huh. Uh, he's got great ties here. He's the first ambassador at CCNC. Uh, man, we got a chance to meet him and talk to him. It's the first time I really had, had a chance to talk. What a grounded individual i mean golf is almost like secondary to like his just so well adjusted and understands life and yeah. family and puts his priorities in order i couldn't agree more uh, basically if you don't like harold Varner, we can't be friends uh, it's that simple <laughs> he's that good a kid when he wins on the pga tour and and it's not a matter of if it's a matter of when and yeah. he may he may win this week uh, i mean he's that hmm. he's that good He's gotten better every year, uh, which, you know, a lot of guys get to a certain point and, and they level off. He got to that point, and now he's taken a couple of big leaps forward this year, winning a, a big tournament over in uh, – in, in, Huge putt yeah, to, in, to win that thing. Right. In, in, in Saudi. In Saudi. And then, uh, you know, coming close. I don't think his first win's going to be a little win. Uh, I think it's going to be, you know, a, a big invitational like the Memorial or even a major Yeah, uh, because he's – He's that good, and he's and he's that ready. Here's a thought for you. 
uh, I know we're on the brink of the U.S. Women's Open uh, here at Pine Needles. Another big event coming to North Carolina this fall is the President's Cup in Charlotte. Yeah. Where Harold uh, makes his home, basically. Imagine if Harold Varner won a time or two between now and then and got on that, uh, got on that President's Cup That would Cup be team. amazing. Uh, the galleries there. Yeah. Would go, that would get Michael Jordan to the golf course that week <laughs> to, to come watch him. I mean, it would be really, really cool. That would be awesome. We'd love to see it. I mean, like you said, he's a great ambassador for the game. Um, talk about, I mean, it seems like it'd be a really cool player to play with in between, you know, in between the ropes. Uh, I mean, did you like to talk when you played oh. or I would imagine you and Harold would have a, that would be a heck of a, a pairing to watch. So I had a lot of caddies over the years. Mostly they'd fire me to move on to a better bag, but uh, I was playing – the first year of the tournament in Tampa, uh, the Valspar is what it's called now. Mm -hmm. On Saturday, I made the cut, and I'm it's a I'm in a twosome with Nick Fauda with Fanny on the back. Fanny's delightful. I see her a lot now. She does uh, Swedish TV at the majors and okay. at the big tournament. So uh, I tend to walk with her in a group, which, which is great. But I told my caddy on the range, I'm going to get that guy to talk to me today. <laughs> he said, oh, my God, you're going to embarrass me, aren't you? I said, oh, yeah, I am going to talk to that guy walking off the first tee, and I'm going to keep talking to him until he tells me to stop talking to him. He told me to stop on four. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's like I, I was like Lee Trevino. Lee Trevino uh, famously in a group, I don't know, remember who he was with. Uh, the guy walked up to him on the first tee and said, Lee, I just don't feel like talking today. And Lee said, hey, that's not a problem. You just have to listen. Yeah. <laughs> that's great. So – you stopped your uh, PJ Tour career uh, and got into broadcasting. Right. And you do a phenomenal job. You've been doing it for a number of years. But from what I understand, it was like the last thing you really wanted to do. Well, I had no idea. Uh, I mean, I, I knew the guys. I saw the guys. Uh, it was 2004. I blew up my elbow in Memphis um, in a cast uh, after having surgery. And my agent called. Now, uh, I, I was at this point looking – at, at an exit strategy from the game, because right. now not only am I not as good as the rest of the guys, now I'm hurt. And so I, I <laughs> a buddy of mine has an insurance company. They sell, sell life insurance, wealth management life insurance. See if you can sell them to the PGA Tour guys. This is a really good idea. So I, I go get my license, yeah. and I'm thinking, I don't ever really want to do this. And my phone rang, and it was my, my agent at the time, and he said, USA Network's looking for a guy to fill in on Thursday and Friday. Uh, for a couple of weeks, do you have any interest? I said, I don't want to be one of those guys. He said, well, hang on a second. The first week is the Senior Players Champion in Deer Championship in Dearborn, Michigan. He said, it's four to six on Thursday and Friday. Four to six on, uh, oh yeah, four to six on Thursday and Friday. So you're on the air for two hours. You fly up Wednesday afternoon. You stay at the Ritz-Carlton. You fly home Friday night and they'll pay you five grand. I said, you Can't know, I could, I could probably do yeah. that. So... <laughs> Here we are, what, almost 18, 19 years later, and that was the best week of broadcasting I ever had. That was the best deal I ever had. Yeah. Every deal since then has paled in comparison to a four-hour work week and getting paid that kind of money. But it, it was great, and I, I stayed with USA Network until Golf Channel took over the Thursday-Friday coverage of PGA Tour right. uh, in 07. Uh, and at that time, during that period of time, in 05, Sirius XM launched PGA Tour Radio, and Live play-by-play -play had started there, and right. I, I was doing that, and I did that until uh, 2015 every week. So I, I I got busy quickly and stayed busy yeah. and learned how to not say um. I think that's my only marketable <laughs> right. skill at this point. And you host a show with Brian Katrick. Uh, you got, I mean, We're I'm, idiots. I'm a, fa I'm a faithful listener. We're it's idiots. A, Channel 92 on Sirius XM, uh, PJ Tour Radio, and uh, just – you guys have such a great time. It must be fun. I mean, you're doing what you love. You get to right. talk about golf, and uh, and you can still get to hang out and go to great venues. And you're going to the the uh, 150th Open Championship. Uh, I am. I, I'm doing. Uh, I'm doing the a PGA Tour live on ESPN Plus coverage a lot of weeks on the PGA Tour, and then I do the majors on the radio for, yeah. for Sirius XM. It's a it's a great gig. Like for example, I I am going to the to the 150th uh, Open Championship at the Old Course, but the week before. I'm working the Scottish Open at the Renaissance okay. Club for yeah. PGA Tour Live. So I'm there for two weeks in July. You guys will be here. It'll be 95 degrees. I'll be over there yeah. freezing. <laughs> like you were at the Masters that one day. I think it was kind of chilly at the oh, Masters this year. Friday at the Masters. Doing the Masters radio broadcast. We actually sit at the top of the grandstands. If you're ever at the Masters and if you get a chance, go. 
Uh, you'll see at the top of, of what they call the, uh, what are they, the observation, uh, patron observation yeah. uh, stands. Up at the top, there's, uh, at some of them, there's plexiglass. And we're sitting in a plexiglass booth. And my, my booth is at the, behind the T on 12. I have Amen Corner. And then when the final groups go through Amen Corner, I hop up to 17 and I do 17. So pretty good gig if you, yeah. if you can. I've got this. This right here on my phone, right there. You know what? I'm not going to tell you what that is. <laughs> but I don't want to get in trouble. <laughs> now, you were here uh, doing some broadcast uh, here at Pine Needles Lodge and Golf Club, and you interviewed Kelly Miller, the president mm. of the resort. Um, I think you had mentioned, or you guys were chatting, and you were going to try and qualify for a U.S. senior event. So you still got an opportunity to go out and play here in the future. I, do, I mean, no. Um, I, I'm not good enough. But I, I, I played U.S. junior, U.S. am. And and four U.S. Opens, and I'd love to play a U.S. Senior Open. Yeah. Uh, last year, uh, the qualifier that I signed up for was the Monday after the PGA Championship at Kiowa, and the qualifier was at, uh, at um, Fayetteville, and uh, I, I just couldn't physically get there. And uh, this year, it's the Monday after Memorial Day, and my wife is on vacation until 10 o'clock uh that Monday night. So I don't know if I'm going to get there this year either, yeah. but I keep signing up for the qualifier just in case. And I'll go to the SAS qualifier for, okay. you know, in Raleigh yeah. at the end of the season, just okay. for the fun of it. Yeah. That's awesome. Well, uh, last great. year, last year I played with Len Matisse and Yarmo Sandlin, two guys that I spent yeah. 10 years on the PGA tour with. So it was a blast. Awesome. Um, We'll talk about some topics on the PGA Tour. You had a chance to actually play with Tiger. It was his third career start. I believe it was, yeah. um, you know, Guy changed the game, obviously. Uh, I played with him at the BC Open, his one and only time at the BC Open. And on he had Fluff Kenny for me, for right. him, as you remember. Well, I, I had uh, I, I met Fluff in 95 at the US Open at Shinnecock. Peter Jacobson was kind enough to play a practice round with me and some other guys. And Fluff and I hit it off. My mother went to Bates College in I Maine. Can see that. He's a Mainer. <laughs> and I mean, it was just, at any rate, uh, so. Tiger is uh, the first two holes. It's where they play the Dick Sporting Goods now. The first two holes at the BC Open are both short par fours. Uh, the third hole is a par five. Tiger pulls it into the into the trees, hits the tree, and kicks out. I rip mine as far as I can down to the corner. I'm going to have about 240 to the front, and if I kill it, I can dribble my three wood right on the front of the green. Yeah, so I'm in good shape. Tiger's 30 yards behind me and pulls an iron out because. I mean, obviously, you're laying up from 270 to the front. Yeah. And he hits this two iron, and it made a sound I've never heard before. <laughs> and it went out, and I'm glad we're on T. I'm glad you have video of this because it, it went out low, and then it rose. And I'd, I'd seen that before, but I'd never seen the second rise. Huh. It rose again. Wow. And he's gone. As soon as he made contact, you know, this skinny kid, he's, he's sprinting after it. And Fluff is standing there, and I looked at Fluff, and I can't say exactly what I said to him, but I asked, what in the world was that? <laughs> and he said, McGinnis, that's our two iron. We carried about 275. Oh and it landed, it landed about three steps on the front of the green. They ran to the back fringe. Now, there's 40 guys on tour that can do that now. This was 1996. Yeah. Yeah. There wasn't anybody on the planet but Tiger Woods that could do that. Uh, and... He not only changed uh, the game, how we approached the game, uh, but but he he approached uh, or he changed the types of people that were going to play the game in the future. We didn't have any Dustin Johnsons on tour back then. Mm -hmm. uh, we didn't have you know six four chiseled. Yeah, we we were all kind of dumpy, wearing you know pleated baggy khakis <laughs> and smoking cigarettes when the cameras weren't on us. <laughs> you can't bum a cigarette on the PGA tour anymore. It's amazing. It's, it really is amazing. Got to ask you, after Tiger hit that shot, how did you hit your shot? I did dribble it right up there in <laughs> front of the green. Okay. Mate, I, 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 I'll never forget this. After two rounds, uh, he was 11 under. I was eight under. He was a shot back. And I thought, you know what? I, I can play with this kid. Yeah. Uh, I don't know if between 1996 and 2005, somebody could go back and verify this. I don't know if I ever beat him in a tournament. I may have beaten him in a round or two, but I don't know if I yeah. ever finished ahead of him in a huh. golf tournament. Well, well, I mean, obviously, arguably, we talk about Jack Nicholas, but arguably Tiger's. I mean, what he has done uh, well, with 
his physical ailments. I mean, the I mean, the guy's lucky to be walking. And then before that, he he wins the 2019 Masters. I mean, was that just where did that come from? I mean, uh, sheer will. Yeah, I mean, it's will, and don't be surprised if he wins another one. Really? Um, I mean, you think he has a chance? I mean, he's yeah. St. Andrews, he loves. I think St. Andrews. I mean, he he won he won at Southern Hills. Uh, yeah. You know, 14 years ago. I, I don't see any reason why he wouldn't. I know he, he, he looked good for a day and a half at Augusta. Mm-hmm. I think we find the right venue. I, I think he could, he, he could pull it off. He's going to be in pain. You know, he's, he's not going to, he's not going to show up at any other events that, that than, uh, than the majors. I don't yeah. think, I don't think we're going to see him like at the Memorial or some of those places that he traditionally loves. I think he's going to play you know, five tournaments a year, the, the four majors and his. And that's fine. Wow. We'll, we'll take it. Yeah. Unbelievable. Well, when you talk about Tiger, you some conversations swirl around. Phil as well. I mean, right. Phil winning the PGA Championship at Kiowa was was tremendous. Um, he's got it kind of gotten sideways, yeah. would you say? Um, will we see him again and when? Yeah, I mean, obviously, he's <laughs> yes. I, I think he has to defend the PGA Championship. Uh, he's in the field. He's in the field at the U.S. Open. Uh, that happened I think last week or two weeks ago, you know, when, when you're an invitee to those events, they, they, they set that field well in advance. Right. So, I mean, he's in both of those fields, this mess with, uh, with, with Greg Norman's tour. I can't even begin to imagine how that's all going to play out. I don't envy Jay Monahan, commissioner of the PGA tour, trying to, to navigate these waters. Uh, Phil is taking a stick and stirring those waters up. Yeah. I don't, I don't know where this all, all plays out. I'm not a fan of it. But you know it, it. It is what it is, and I mean, they're the money that they're about to play for is real. Yeah, and uh, there's a whole lot of it. And and anybody you expect to take advantage of that? I mean, I know there's been yeah rumors to be quite a few. Yeah, I mean, they're they're Greg's claiming he has 15 of the top 100 in the world right now. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's going to put a lot of pressure on the tour to to allow these guys to to go play in these events. The, the first event in England, I think that Jay Monahan probably has to issue releases for, let his players go play, but it's in the bylaws of the tour that you can't get a release to play in a, an event opposite a PGA tour event anywhere in North America. So mm-hmm. the second event on that tour is in Oregon. There's one yeah. in, there's one in Chicago. There's one in, is it Boston? I think, or maybe, maybe the other way. I don't, I don't know the exact schedule. And there's uh, the final event at, at Trump Doral. You know, this is the, the lawyers are going to have to get involved right. before this all plays out. And you know, Greg Norman's not going to take his foot off the pedal on this one. He, he yeah. he's going I, for blood. Yeah, he, I don't think like, so. He'd like to blow up the PGA Tour and wow. create his own. Yeah. So, um, you know, with with this pending, I mean, at what point is m- is it money versus winning majors and having the prestige of, of well, winning a major? Well, that the USGA is put in in the most awkward position uh, as we sit here before the uh, a USGA major. There will be an LIV event before the U.S. Open. Hmm. Is the is the USGA going to allow players who have broken free and gone over there to come play in the U.S. Open? I think they have to. There, it's open. Yeah. Um, but they really don't have to. I mean, it's their tournament. They can do whatever they want to. Same same position that uh, putting the RNA in with the British Open. So uh, who knows? Uh, the PGA of America with the PGA Championship sort of dodged a bullet because the first event is is after the PGA Championship yeah. at Tulsa. If you're the PGA commissioner, that mm. issue being set aside, if you were to change anything with the PGA Tour, what would it be? Um, or improve anything with the PGA Tour. I hated it when they reduced the number of players that made the cut a few years ago from 70 to 65, and, and a, cu- a couple of reasons. One, it didn't solve the problem. The problem they were trying to solve is slow play on the weekends. There's still slow play on the weekends. Yeah. Um, in twosomes, they play just as fast as they always played. They just have to start a little bit earlier if there's 80 guys instead of 70 guys. Uh, but you know, one of the unbreakable records in all the sports is Tiger's cut streak, you know, 146 cuts. Is mind-boggling. Yeah. Jay Haas has just made his 594th cut. You know, not all cuts are equal now, because if you finish 68th this week uh, at whatever event, 
you missed the cut. Yeah. Whereas that used to make the cut. So, you know, why are, there's more money out there. You know, it's eight or nine, ten thousand dollars for last. And if you if you make the cut on the number, you know, I didn't see I didn't see that helping anybody, and it certainly didn't solve any problems with slow play. Yeah. Let's talk about a uh, golf course. We'll talk about Pinehurst in a minute. I mean, obviously your favorite destination, I'm sure. But if there are five courses when you played on the PJ tour, what are the five courses that, that you love the most? Well, I agree with Mr. Nicholas that if I had one round of golf left to play, I'd play Pebble beach. Um, it's, I, I remember getting there in 96, my rookie year, playing the practice round teed off with, uh, with, with Jerry Kelly. And, um, uh, I'm going to think of it. He was a Milwaukee brewer, uh, Robin Yount. Okay. And, uh, cause of course celebrity pro am. And we had the first tee time on Tuesday off one at Pebble and just got to play Pebble beach. And, uh, I got to 18 T and they were still chipping and putting over on 17. And I hit that drive and I told my caddy, give me another one. And I hit <laughs> that drive. And I said, how many are in there? eight I said let me have them all and I hit every ball in my bag off that 18 feet I mean it was for me that was uh, look I loved Riviera I loved I loved so many of the courses Hilton Head uh, on the PGA Tour but uh I don't know for me watching that tournament as a kid yeah watching the 92 U.S. Open watching the 82 U.S. Open even um I, I couldn't wait to get there it was it was the one for me a couple other courses <laughs> that are your favorites when you played um I got to play the U.S. Open in 95 at Shinnecock, and that that is a very special experience yeah. there. Uh, and I got to play it again just a couple of years ago for the first time since. I, I covered uh, two U.S. Opens there before I got to uh, yeah. before I got to play it again, which was uh, w which was a lot of fun. Uh, I mean, we play a PGA Tour event at my home course in Greensboro, so I'm pretty partial to Sedgefield. Although yeah. I never got to play a tour event there, we played huh. at Forest Oaks. Yeah. That's right. Uh, uh, you know, so, so many great golf courses that the PGA Tour uh, goes to. Uh, and it's fun for me to, to just get to go back and, and walk them now. And then Pinehurst, um, you know, talk about how you've been coming uh, here. I mean, you were a camp counselor here at, at Pine Needles. How special is, is Pinehurst to you? I, I don't know that you can truly uh, appreciate Pinehurst in a visit. I, I think you have to keep coming back here. I mean, uh, Tom Pashley will tell you that the things over there on their nine courses are constantly evolving, right. and they are. Things over here at Pine Needles on these three golf courses are constantly evolving. You can hear the construction in the background. Yeah. Um, <laughs> right. uh, you know, uh, then, then you know, I played a mini tour event at Longleaf, and the other course was the pit that doesn't even exist anymore. Which will be Pinehurst number 10 more which, than likely. Right, which will, which will be something else. Uh, you know, you can you can spread out just a little bit from here, and – get to so many other other incredible golf courses I, I don't know that you can you can see them all in a short period of time I, I for me for the 13th year in a row I'm bringing a group to Pinehurst in September I was uh, just going to say go ahead and plug that yeah sure where there's sidekick I, I, Brian I think we're sold out uh, and and Greg Austin uh here uh talked me into doing this the first year I had a radio show and so we bring it's called the On Tap Invitational. It's a two-person uh, event. We we play number two. We stay at the Holly. Uh, we play number. I think we're playing four and nine this year. Uh, we have stayed here. We have stayed right over there. Yeah. Um, and, and done these three courses, and we'll probably come back here next year. I mean, it's to me, it's the most fun thing to put on, and then it sells out pretty quickly. And I, I did go on the landing page, and so there there's a very short waiting list. Uh huh. Mike is it Mike Weir is on the waiting list. Uh, uh, my, my, I know it's the same Mike Weir. Okay, so it's not the same Mike Weir. <laughs> okay. But his partner is Mike Mills, the bass player from REM. Oh, okay. So his, his his partner, and they won two years ago, and then because he's a rock and roll star, forgot to sign up the next year. And so they got <laughs> they got bumped the next year. So uh, Mike Weir is the son of a, of a good friend, Brian Weir, who I met in the first year at the Monday Pro-Am at Quail Hollow. Yeah. In 2003, they live in Scottsdale, and we've been friends ever since. If you have meet somebody that has never been to Pinehurst, what what would you tell them? Uh, I, I would tell them to reach out, you know, to 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 explore. There's so much to see here. Go to the Tufts archives. Go go mm -hmm. go to dinner. If you're if you're staying here, 
go to dinner elsewhere. If you're staying at the resort, go to dinner elsewhere. You know, go go see all the Pinehurst. Don't just stay in one in one spot because there's so much to see. And what I love about this is, as we've uh, grown up, so has Pinehurst, and mm -hmm. th there weren't that many permanent residents here. But the permanent residents here get it. They moved here for a reason, and they understand why people visit. I don't think anybody moved here without visiting here first. And so they get it. So they yeah. feel like they're hosts. And if, if you are having a conversation at one of the restaurants and, and run into uh, folks from Country Club of North Carolina, for example, they're, they're, they want to tell you about Country Club of North right. Carolina. You know, same, same with all the other clubs around here. I love that aspect of it. People, this is a golf town. And... You can sit on the porch at the Pinecrest and have a conversation with somebody from Canada and somebody who lives right around the Absolutely. corner about the same same thing. And then that guy that lives here, by the way, folks, don't chip with him in the fireplace. <laughs> He's going to take your money. Right. And we are the home of American Golf, and uh, the home of American Golf will host the U.S. Women's Open here the first week of June, which mm. will be next week as this broadcasts. Uh, you know, Pine Needles has had awesome champions from Annika Sorenstam, Christy Kerr, Kari Webb. Uh, you know, it's going to crown another great champion. I don't know if you, how much you follow the ladies' game, since you're so involved with the PJ Tour, but, I mean, who would be some of your favorites here? I like Lydia Ko's game on this golf course. Uh, I think you have to have a great short game uh, to get yeah. around here. You have to be a fabulous ball striker, but you're going to miss. This This is Donald Ross uh, at his best. Uh, it's, it's hillier than you expect it to be. Mm -hmm. uh, you hear that a lot, but... Uh, with with the elevation change, uh, shot values are, are are increased, and so you're going to miss some greens. I like somebody with with a solid short game. Uh, I like where she is. I'd love to see Lexi Thompson, who played so well last year, yeah. get back in the mix. Uh, I, I think that would be fun. Uh, you know, there, there's there, there's so many great young players out there. Somebody's going to emerge. You know, we're going to get a Lucy Lou story. Uh, yeah. We don't know who that's going to be or what that's going to be, but you know, those those always entertain me too. I, I think from a from a fan standpoint, Thursday and Friday of the U.S. Women's Open, for that reason, is far more entertaining than Thursday and Friday of the Men's U.S. Open. Uh, you know, we'll, we'll get a, a name or two on that leaderboard too, but you know, that that's not somebody that's got high school to go back to. That's right. somebody that yeah. you know is going back to the Corn Ferry Tour or sure. the European Tour. Well, John McGinnis, we certainly enjoyed your time today. Appreciate you taking time out. I know you're going to go play some golf at Southern Pines Golf Club, which you've never played. I mean, it built Hard in 1906, a Donald Ross original. Kelly Miller is probably his favorite golf course of the three. Uh, he's f quickly fallen in love with that place, and Kyle France did a phenomenal job of, of uh, renovating that golf course. Can't wait. Uh, I'm looking forward to it. Um, how many shots do I get? Uh, from me, none. <laughs> I'm, I'm going to be asking you. We'll have, we'll have to get you uh, some bourbon quickly uh, to, to, for me to have a chance. But, John McGinnis, uh, as always, uh, you're a tribute to the game. We appreciate everything you do, your contributions, uh, your talent uh, with PGM or PGA Tour Radio on Sirius XM. That's Channel 92. Uh, listen to McGinnis and Katrick uh, on tap. Uh, it's a great show. They have great insights. And, uh, once again, thank you so much for your time. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. Well, that's it for Paradise in the Pines. I'm Phil Wurz. If you want to listen to more or find out more about the destination, go to homeofgolf.com. Check out our YouTube channel, which is Home of American Golf. Or if you want to catch the podcast, Paradise in the Pines, go to your favorite podcatcher. I like Spotify. Uh, but this, again, has been Paradise in the Pines. Thanks again to John McGinnis from SiriusXM PGA Tour Radio.